Good morning. Uh, my presentation is mainly about an exploitation method that can be applied for use of the freeze in Adobe Flash. Uh, my name is Guan Xingwen, and here's a brief introduction of myself. I'm a security researcher of Pangu, and previously, most of my time was focusing on Flash security, find its vulnerabilities, and keep track of the state of art of exploitation. And many of the bugs I report to Adobe are also made public through Internet Bug Bounty. I'm currently the top one contributor for this platform, and maybe forever, since HackerOne has stopped accepting new Flash vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, in their opinion, they think Flash exploit no longer have the same impacts as when they start, so they will shifting the bounty resource to open source infrastructure. And the method we're going to talk about today is developed during the research of CV 2016 which is the use of the free uh, discover and report to Adobe this May. So here is the agenda of my speech. I will start with the, I will start by introducing the basic ideas of how classical flash exploit works and how recently mitigations prevent the classical trick. Next, I will show my method, uh, which can bypass these mitigations, and then we'll build exploit step by step with this method for CVE 2016 1.7. At the end of the talk, I will also discuss how to exploit under 64-bit environment and how Windows 10 affects the exploitation. So for the past three years, maybe more, the classical flash exploit is mainly about crop the lens field of a vector object, no matter what type the, no matter what type the bug is. Uh, so for example, heap overflow. And the exploit will start by spraying vectors and leak memory holes by freeing some of the vectors. So that when the vulnerable buffer is created, it will occupy one of the memory holes and crop the lens field of the vector object by triggering the overflow. The vector with a very large lens will be used to search the process memory for rope guards, shell codes, and buffers, all kinds of structures you might need for exploit work. And then finally, the rope chain will be triggered by a fake word function table. And when it comes to use of the free, the process is very similar. With the proper heap memory layout, uh, the vulnerable object following one of the memory holes will be released because of use of the free and then occupied with controlled vector data. And after that, when a um, member function or member property of this downlink pointer is invoked, a fully controllable memory write will corrupt one of the lens field of the vector object. And when we find that a corrupted vector, everything else goes like that of heap overflow. Since the lens field is located at the beginning part of the vector buffer, it is very convenient to be corrupted with wireless uh, of flash even browser vulnerabilities. So this technique has been very popular for the past years, mainly because Adobe only fix the vulnerability itself instead of mitigate the exploitation method. So finally, last December, the popularity of hacking, team, hacking Team's Flash exploit played a major role for Adobe's final decision. So working with Google Project Zero, Adobe adds mitigations to Vector, and after the mitigation, the lens field is moved to the metadata part of the Vector object, only left with the verification field in the same position. Since the lens field and the verification field are now in different memory block, corrupt them at the same time is not practical. Besides the vector mitigation, Adobe also adds verification fields to byte array, which is another very popular array-like structure that is widely used in exploit. Well, the lens field and the verification fields are now still staying in the same memory block, although very rare. Powerful zero-day exploit, including those used by Pontoon, were able to read the verification field first and then calculate the security value by XOR the lens field and the verification fields and then crop them with the new value at the same time. Uh, but this behavior is highly depends on the quality of the vulnerability. To read and then crop almost means the bug itself is capable of read and write any piece of the memory, let's say a type confusion. So even without corruption of the byte array, 
the vulnerability itself can finish the exploitation, and to crop binary regions make the exploit code simpler to write. And besides the lens verification, isolated heap is also introduced into Adobe Flash. Right now, there are many heap partitions inside uh, Flash. Well, this technique is first explained in Google Project Zero's blog, and basically, the data and the object are now separating into different memory blocks. So even if there's a use of the free, we cannot control its memory with vector or byte array anymore. Yet it is still possible to control the freed object with other class objects in the same heap partition. And that is something we're gonna use later for our exploit work. So in summary, the mitigations had disarmed the classical and popular flash exploit method. Um, before the mitigation, there may be two or three flash exploit in the wild for a month, but after the mitigation, there may be just one or two flash exploit in the wild for half a year. So the mitigation itself is very useful and powerful. And today we mainly focus on use of the free. Let's see how to bring this type of bug back to life. So what is really necessary for use of the free bug to work? Uh, in my opinion, I think a read primitive helps a lot. And that is the past year's flash exploit all shares. So right now, only with the read primitive can you find rope guards and buffers to store the shellcode and the wrappers to set executed bit of shellcode. As we're talking about use of the free, we're able to fake the virtual function table by just memory occupation. So a write primitive is not a necessity. Currently, exploit can read primitive by tempering the length field of a vector object. Uh, byte array uh, and other structures that works like array. Well, our approach is to temper the start address of the array-like structure. Also, byte array and vector are not only candidates. There are other array-like structures inside Adobe Flash. And for proof of concept, I will start with the simplest array-like structure, the string object. So if a class holds a string inside, a structure will be something like this. There will be a virtual function table, a reference count, other fields, at least contain a buffer and a length dedicated to a string. But the string here I'm talking about is not an action script string. So if it is really an action script string, it will be just a reference pointer here instead of a buffer and a length. But some class, they choose to store the string inside with no further operations. So they will use a self-defined light-weighted structure inside of the uh, highway-weighted action script string. Uh, so somehow, with the help of use of the free, we were able to release the class memory and then control this memory by occupation where the start address of the string object can be any desired value. Right now, we are able to access the target memory through the string object. And after dealing with the target memory, uh, let's assume we can release this class memory again. And in the real world case, I will show you how this step can be done, but currently, let's just assume the step can finish itself. So when the class memory is released again, we can occupy it with another bunch of data, where the start address can be another value. And with su such release and occupation over and over, the string object becomes a read primitive. And that is the main idea of our exploitation method. Since there were many cycles of release and occupation, the method is named as use after use of the free. But this is maybe too ideal the situation. So let's come back to the beginning of the use of the free. When the vulnerable object is released, uh, a structure may not contain a string inside. So we should occupy its class memory with other classes, our selected classes, which holds a string inside. And after the, uh, well, because of isolated heap, this two class memory should also stay in the same heap partition and in the same size. So after occupation, we will invoke the virtual function of the downing pointer. It is now the virtual function with the same offset, but in the selected class memory being indexed. The key point is that such type confusion status wasn't expected by any of the functions. So this unexpected behavior may help us release the class memory. 
and then when we are in the rate primitive situations that we have discussed before. So here are the basic steps turning a use of the free into a rate primitive. But these are all abstract concepts. So let's go through a real world case to see how this actually works. CV 2016 1S7 is a use of the free I discovered in PSDK class. PSDK belongs to Meteor Core package. I discovered this package, uh, I think this package is first introduced into Flash version 19. And I discovered this package by decompiling the player global file and cross comparing it with its old version. There were many classes under this package, but all of these classes are undocumented. There is only some related information can be found from another Adobe products called Primetime Player SDK. This SDK is mainly to use develop to uh, is mainly used to develop TV-based cross-platform application. And for the PC environment, the SDK is a bunch of ActionScript files. Uh, so my best guess is that the package I found is a native um, is a native implementation of this SDK inside Flash Player to accelerate the running speed. Apparently, when the first time this package is introduced into Flash, it haven't been thoroughly tested. I found many, many memory corruptions last August, and after reporting them to Adobe, they choose to remove the entire package from its next version. So for that moment, I just think maybe the whole package shouldn't be ex exposed to the developer. But after half a year, the whole package is back, into Flash version 21. So the truth behind is uh, finish, uh, fix all of this memory corruptions takes time. So Adobe used half a year to finish, uh, fix all of, all of these bugs and reintroduce them into Flash version 21. And the use of the free we're talking about here is discovered right after PSDK and the Meteor package packages back. <coughs> Here's the code snippet to triggering the use of the free. The only way to get an instance of PSDK is through its statical member property called little capital PSDK. So apparently, the class memory is constructed and initialized by ActionScript Virtual Machine, the AVM itself. So naturally, the class memory should also be destructed and cleaned by AVM automatically. But the weird part is that this class also contains a method called release which can be invoked directly from the ActionScript level to explicitly release the class memory of PSDK. Well, this is rarely the case for ActionScript objects. Normally, all the Flash objects are completely managed by MMGC, the garbage collector. So the only way to actually release the class memory is you just don't use them. So the reference count of this class will be zero. And MMGC will scan all the objects and find the proper moment to actually release the class memory. But as this class is undocumented, so we don't know if this release um, is necessary or not. But at, at least the reference count wasn't cleaned after release. So the atom reference pointer is still point to the class memory after release. And when we invoke the virtual function with this pointer, there goes the old textbook use of the free. So the root cause of this vulner vulnerability is very easy to understand. Let's go build the exploit. <coughs> PSDK takes 32 bytes. There are two virtual function tables at the beginning of this class memory. All the member functions that can be invoked from the action script level are indexed in the first virtual function table. And the destructor is index indexed in the second one. But the destructor can only be invoked by MMGC. <coughs> Other fields of this class are irrelevant to our exploit, so I will skip a thorough demonstration. So after PSDK is released, we should occupy its class memory with another class, as we discussed before. So I manually checked all the classes and their media core package. I think they are most likely the best candidates. Uh, classes under the same package are very likely to implement in a similar way, especially for their heap partition. So finally, after several checks, I pick track. It contains two string field. And after memory alignment, track is in the same size of PSDK. 
So meaning that when PSDK is released, newly constructed track will then occupy its memory. And right now, when we invoke the virtual function of PSDK, let's say the query dispatcher located at 14 hex offset, it is now the virtual function of track being indexed. And this type confusion function call treated the second double word of current class memory to be a reference count, decremented and release current memory if the reference count is zero. So this type confusion call is very like a destructor. And the second double word of current class memory is happened to be the length field of the first string object inside track. So simply initialize track with a single character string can we control this field to be one and after decremation, the memory of track will be released. And right now, we have a dunning pointer in type of track that is created by us. Uh, but we still need to find a way to occupy the memory of track uh, to control its content and release the class memory again. And there I will introduce you set byte array, which is, another, uh, which is a very handy function that almost born to finish the task that we have left. It can occupy the memory of track and then release it at the same time. <clears throat> so set byte array simply duplicate the uh, input byte array inside metadata. And metadata also belongs to media core package. So it is sharing the same heap partition with track and PSDK. Set byte array will allocate a temporary space to pre-processing the input byte array. Uh, if the encoding and the lens is okay, then set by the array will allocate another memory to save the content of this uh, to save the content of this byte array and save the pointer inside metadata. Since this temporary space is first allocated, if the input byte array is 32 bytes long, the same size of PSDK, the temporary space is what occupies the memory of PSDK. So we can just use a 32 bytes long byte array and evoke set byte arrays, the memory of track will be controlled. And the best part of this is when at the end of the set byte array, this temporary space will be released explicitly. So meaning that the memory of track fitting with controlled content is still being freed waiting for next occupation. Recall from the last part, when PSDK is released, track take its position and type confusion function call release track memory again. And for the read primitive uh, part, each time we want to read access the target memory, we just use set byte array um, with a 32 bytes long byte array, which is 16 offset to be the target address. The 16 offset is happened to be the second uh, string field inside uh, track. So after set by the array, when we invoke chat doc language, which is the second string field, we can access the target memory. <coughs> right now, I just set the string length to be four. There is no need to be a large number, eight, a thousand, as the returning of the string object contains an, an encoding problem. So if there is some special character in the string memory, in the target memory, the returning of the string will be broken, and in that case, we still need to read the uh, target memory character after character. So I just set the length to be four. So in most cases, the returning value will be four bytes long. It can easily convert it to be a uh, int value, very convenient to deal with, with other part of, of your exploit. So right now we have the ability to read any part of the memory. I think everything else can only limited by imagination, there will be many op options. Let's say we can read a stable location spread with vector object. Uh, out of opt a vector object is filled with current class pointer, this. And although vector cannot be used to be cropped, it is still a very feasible way for heap spread. So when we read a stable location, we know that this pointer is located right after the metadata of vector object. And with this pointer, we can easily find all the self-defined variables inside our class. Let's say we can find the byte array, the string, the track, uh, vector, and they're all started with 54 hex offset. 
uh, with as we know the with simple reverse engineering, you can know the structure of these classes. So you can find a buffer inside to store a shell code, rope chain, fake word function table. And this trick is firstly used by hacking teams flash exploit. It is very efficient. There is no need for brutal force searching of your uh, self-defined variables. And after that, we can use one of the virtual function table of this class to find a module base of flash and start to search the rope, rope garbage for, for exploit. And after every buffer is filled, linked, set better array is invoked one more time to crop the second virtual function table of PSDK. The reason we choose the second virtual function table instead of the first one is that uh, as you can remember, it is the temporary space that occupies and controls the memory of PSDK. And the release of this temporary space has one minor side effect. It modifies the first byte of current class memory, meaning that we cannot fully control the first virtual function table. So we choose the second one. Uh, to, uh, we can crop the second virtual function table pointing to our rope chain. The second virtual function table belongs to the destructor of PSDK. So after every exploit code that we have written in the flash file is executed, MMGC will kick in and try to release other class memory. And that is the moment our rope chain is being executed. The rope chain simply point EX to a controllable memory and invoke a wrapper inside flash. So this wrapper is very convenient. You just invoke a point EX to a controllable memory, make sure EX minus eight and EX minus four pointing to the uh, start address and the length of the shell code, and then wrapper will invoke virtual protect inside to set the executed bit of the shell code and then jump over. The, this wrapper code is firstly used by CV 2014-0515. The searching pattern for this wrapper hasn't changed ever since until flash version 22. Uh, the reason for this changing is a new mitigation called memory protector is introduced into flash version 22. But as this new mitigation doesn't affect our exploitation or the vulnerabilities, so I have skipped uh, its, its demonstration at the mitigation part. But I will mention this mitigation later in the conclusion. So after invoke the wrapper, and then we jump over to the shell code. It's a demo. The code is running under seven. The read primitive part will be a little time consuming as you can see there are six or seven lines for the exploit to work, uh, for the read primitive to work. This is highly weighted compared to the traditionally vector plus index number. So currently, what we have discussed is under 32-bit environment. What about 64-bit environment? Uh, first thing, the pointer is changing from four bytes long to eight bytes long. And many class are in different size. As a result, PSDK and track, these two classes are now in different size, so they cannot occupy each other. We should find another class to occupy the memory of PSDK, and that is media resource. Mini resources and also under mini core package. So it is sharing the same heap partition. And it contains a string inside. So after PSDK is released, mini resource will then occupy its memory. And this time the type confusion function call will treat the F0 hex offset to be a reference count, decremented release current memory if the reference count is zero. So this is very similar with 32 bit. But except this time we cannot control the F0 hex offset memory with MIDI resource itself, because F0 is a very large number, and this memory is out of bound of MIDI resource. MIDI resource is only uh, 40 or 50 bytes long. So we should occupy and control this part of memory before PSDK is released. There are two reasons why we can invoke set battery one, uh, one time to control this part of memory. The first reason is that PSDK and track and MIDI resource, all these classes we have discussed under MIDI core package, they're using a different heap partition compared to traditional flash objects. 
Uh, traditional layout of flash objects are completely managed by MMGC, where virtual alloc on self-defined flash heap. But for these classes we have discussed, they're managed by malloc and free directly on the default heap or the CRT heap. So that means the memory of PSDK and these classes are very pure. There won't be any interference uh, of the memory of the PSDK into our set battery. So when set battery is invoked, it is the first time the memory of after the memory of the PSDK is allocated. So that is reason we can control that part of memory. And the second reason is PSDK take uh, 40 or 50 bytes, and there are two memory blocks inside the battery, as you can remember. So these two, three memory blocks added together help us control the memory of F0 hex offset. Then we can set that value to be one, and this time the type of confusion call can work correctly and release the memory of media resource. So again, we are in the read primitive situation. But this time we cannot just read a stable location spread with vector object anymore. <coughs> Since tr uh, traditional flash objects under 64-bit environment are high 32-bit randomized, so even we have spread terabytes of memory, we cannot control a, s a stable location with our controlled data. Luckily, I find that spreading malloc flash objects doesn't derive the high entropy under, under Windows 7. So I just choose another class under MediaCore package. It is add asset. As you, you know, it is uh, malloced. So add asset works like an array. The class inside will duplicate themselves and spring the memory when we invoke the constructor. All the cl class memory will be, uh, their, their high third to be will remain zero. So we can start to brute force searching the spread memory. And one of the class being spread is media resource. As you can remember, it contains a string inside. Also, there is an int value. So this int value can be used as a flag. When we, when we find that flag during the brute force searching, we know that media resource is here, and metadata is adjacent. Metadata can be used as a replacement of vector and byte array. Uh, it contains the buffer inside just like vector or byte array. And this buffer can be easily find where fixed offset, only to notice that the offset for the second step is calculated where hash function. The hash value is only 0 to 7, and the input value is the key names, that is the first parameter of set byte array. Uh, so what, there is very likely a hash collision but we don't add one and hash collisions. Or otherwise, there will be a list structure inside metadata, and finding the buffer inside will be very much difficult. So we just choose different names as, and make sure their hash value is different, as we don't need so many buffers. So after all of this has, has done, we can find all the buffers, and these buffers can be filled and linked just like 32-bit, and the, fake virtual function type of trick works just like before. So currently, all of this has been discussed under Windows 7. What about Windows 10? First, I didn't intend to build a fully workable exploit under Windows 10. As for Windows 7, there are many new things, new, mitig new mitigations, new heap spring method, and new heap partition. Also, there are a lot of reverse engineering of all the classes and, and then remedial core. So I don't want to do all of this under Windows 10 again. I just need to take a quick peek to see what's the difference for Windows 10. First, PSDK is still malloced on the low fragment heap, uh, the RFH. This is absolutely the same with Windows 7. But RFH itself is changing from Windows 7 to Windows 10. There is a heap randomization added into Windows 10. So for Windows 7, when the memory of PSDK is released, uh, it comes down, to the free, uh, comes down to the end of the free list. And when next allocation is coming, the last memory block being freed will be the next one being allocated. So it is very predictable. We know that the memory of PSDK will be occupied with just one occupation. 
with, with just one allocation. But for Windows 10, there is a bitmap controlling the low fragment heap allocation. But we can still use the FreeList model to explain what happened. So when the memory of PSDK is released, it comes down to the FreeList. Let's say there is 16 blocks in this FreeList. And when next allocation is coming, RFH will randomly choose one of those 16 blocks to be the next one being allocated, meaning that we don't know if the memory of PSDK is occupied or not with just one allocation. So a direct idea to bypass this is multiple occupation. As you have said, there are 16 blocks, so why not we just use 16 allocations, make sure the PSDK memory is occupied. But this is only partially correct. As you can see, the, for the first 15 allocation, everything goes normal. But for the 16th allocation, RFH won't use the last memory block inside this free list. And it will allocate a new free list and choose one of those memory blocks to be the next one being allocated, just to enlarge the randomization. But this randomization is still limited. After two or three cycles of free list allocation, RFH will finally release, uh, realize that, well, I still have a memory block inside the first free list, and why not using it? It's a waste. So that is the moment RFH will allocate the last memory block inside the first free list, and that is the moment we know the memory of PSDK is occupied. All of these demonstrations is based on black box heap experiments, but I have discussed with uh, other people who have done fully re reverse engineering of NTDEL to see how RFH works, and all of these demonstrations has been confirmed. So meaning that after PSDK is released, we can construct track hundreds of times, and this will make sure the memory of PSDK is occupied. And this time, the type confusion function call actually makes things easier for us. We don't need to control any part of the memory just pass the parameter to be one, and then the memory of track will be released. And then we're in the read primitive situation. But this time, still for the situation, we need multiple occupation, meaning that for each cycle, we need to use a multiple set by the array to control the content of track. But I didn't go any step further, so although Windows 10 brings us a tough environment, use after use after free may still find its way for read primitive. So for the conclusion part, first about a fix. After reporting this issue to Adobe, uh, their fix is manually remove the reference pointer from the action script level, which is used to uh, invoke release. And when I, said, when I said manually, meaning that this fix can be bypassed. So there goes another uh, vulnerability, CV 2016-448. And I bypassed this first fix by declaring two references pointing to <coughs> PSDK and invoke release with one of them but triggering the use of the free with another. And to exploit the second vulnerability, there, I, f I find that there's only one line change uh, necessary for the exploit to work, only the triggering part. And, but when, this, when I try to exploit the second bug, it is now flash version 22. As I have told you before, it was a memory protector. A new mitigation is added into Adobe Flash. Memory protector is used to delay the free of objects. Uh, mitigation mainly used for use of the free, and maybe something learned from Microsoft IE. But this mitigation doesn't affect our exploitation or the vulnerability, even if we're talking about use of the free. Um, the reason for that is memory protector only maybe only focusing on objects that are managed by MMGC, not our malloc and the freed managed objects. Or maybe this memory protector only focusing on stack pointers, um, but our pointer is saved in the heap inside PSDK. But I haven't given it a thorough, a thorough analysis as this it doesn't affect my exploitation. So for the second fix, Adobe choose again to re remove this function from ActionScript level. So if they really don't need this function, why should they introduce it at first place? 
So maybe this is just another temporary fix, just as before. I've met such temporary fix many times before. So once I have a heap overflow, and after a patch, uh, the heap overflow is gone. And the reason for that is the heap memory is doubled. So my heap overflow cannot overflow that much of memory, and that is the reason it's gone. But after several versions of Adobe Flash, the bug is back. So I check the code again. I see the calculation of the heap memory is rolling back. So the truth is, the first fix is a temporary fix for some other people's heap overflow. But after several versions, after Adobe figure out how to calculate the right size of the heap, they're rolling back to the old calculation. But that doesn't, fi uh, doesn't fix my heap overflow, so it is back. So if this fix is actually a temporary fix, after several versions of Flash, maybe it will come back. If still they use manually re remove of this pointer, there may be still a bypass. <coughs> so for the use of the use of the free, I think it's a relatively common way to exploit the use of the freeze in Adobe Flash. Although the first part um, that it used a type confusion function call to release the class memory seems a little complicated, but I have uh, accomplished this under three versions of Adobe Flash, uh, the 32-bit and 64-bit and the Windows 7 and the 32-bit and the Windows 10. So I think it is still practical, only you need a lot of reverse engineering. And currently, we're dealing with a string object, and thus give us a read primitive. And in the future, if we can find some other array-like structure to crop with, maybe we can get a write primitive. And that will be much helpful for the exploit work and the Windows 10. And the problem for the string object is when you try to read the target memory, everything goes well. But when you try to write the target memory. It will allocate a new buffer to save what you are going to write and then save the pointer inside. So we cannot just write any target memory. But if you can find another array-like structure which use the target address to be the one written in, that, that, that is we can find a write primitive. And the idea behind the use of the use of the free, I think, is more common. As I have seen such release and occupation and uh, type confusion things in an iOS kernel exploit. So I think this method, uh, the idea behind this method can be implemented in other platforms and softwares. So that is all for my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>